Part One. You will hear a woman talking to a man who works in a tourist information office. First, you have some time to look at questions. Good afternoon. Can I help you? I hope so. My Portuguese friends are coming over to visit me next month, and I need to find a place for them to stay that is quite central, as I live in the city centre myself and want them to be close by. Can you recommend anywhere? Yes, a few places instantly spring to mind. What about Belvedere Gardens Hotel? Despite what the name might suggest, it's right in the city centre, on Main Street, opposite Grimes Tower. How much is it per night, please? Quite reasonable, given the location, fifty dollars, and that is inclusive of a continental breakfast. Oh, that sounds nice. What about other meals? Do you have to pay extra for them? Yes, unfortunately, lunch and dinner are not included in the price. The hotel does have a very fine restaurant, though, and I would thoroughly recommend the buffet dinner there. Customers should be seated by seven thirty in the evening when the buffet starts. Hmm. I'll keep it in mind. Is there anywhere else you can think of? Certainly,、uh, the Belfield Grand is always a popular choice. It's located a little further out, though, on the south side of Edgware Common. Perhaps that's too far from the city centre. Not really. It's only a few stops on the subway. Depends on the price. Believe it or not, the Belfield is more expensive th than Belvedere Gardens. Fifty-five dollars. Oh, that's no good. Mind you, there is a ten-dollar discount offered to customers who have booked online. There's also the fact that the price is inclusive of all meals. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner served in the guests' lounge. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. I like the sound of this hotel more and more. The Belfield, then, so far. Is there anywhere else? Well, you should also consider the Maple View. I don't think I'm familiar with that one. You should be. It's right in the heart of the city, next to the entrance to the pedestrian zone that runs along High Street. Sounds lovely, being so close to the shops. Tell me more. It gets better. The price per night is only twenty-eight dollars on weekdays, though an additional twelve dollars is charged on weekends and bank holidays. Sounds like great value for money. It is.、Uh, that's why you have to book well in advance of your stay. How soon should I book then? Yesterday might not be soon enough. Yikes! I'd better get cracking. Thank you so much for your help. You're very welcome. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to a group of tourists who are visiting a cave in Vietnam. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our visit to one of the most famous caves in Vietnam. As you know, this cave is famous for its wildlife, and one of the creatures you will observe in here is the small cave cockroach. They live mostly on the bird and bat droppings that are so plentiful in the caves. The guard rails along the trails are covered with these droppings, and this makes a feast for the cockroaches. So be careful where you put your hands. They will not harm you, but it can be a shock if you touch them. Once you're in one of the main caves, look out for the green centipedes. They will not be on the trail, but can often be seen on the wall close by. They feed on other insects and are fascinating to look at because of their colour and, of course, their many legs. Please, please do not try to pick one up, though. These centipedes have a very nasty poisonous bite. There are also deep red millipedes. These have a fully rounded shape, and they look like a streamlined elongated train with a hundred or so closely packed legs extending right and left. When you get to the large high caves, you should look right up above you for the swifts and bats. The bats in this cave are mostly a type of dwarf bat, which are common in this part of the world. They will be clustered high up against the walls, maybe a hundred or two hundred together. They look like shadows high on the walls of the cave. They are likely to be very quiet right now, but because there are so many of them together, you will have no difficulty identifying them. They sleep all day until they all leave the cave in a massive flock on their nightly hunt for flying insects. The swifts are the creatures you can see flying around during the day, especially if they have young ones to feed. They can navigate in the darkness here and will fly outside in ones and twos at dusk to catch small winged insects like mosquitoes. However, they tend to return before it's pitch black outside and they do not hunt at night. The swifts make nests, usually higher up on the ceiling of the cave. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The paths tend to run around the edges of the large caves. Mostly this is because the centre is a mound of guano, the bird and bat droppings. This is also the source of the strong smell inside the caves. You may not like this smell, but the locals know its economic value. They have harvested the product of these caves for centuries. The guano is very valuable as fertilizer, and so it's collected each year, once the young birds have grown and the swifts have abandoned their nests. The guano is not the only valuable byproduct of the wildlife here. As you travel through the caves, you will notice some bamboo structures. These very flimsy-looking sets of poles that go a full hundred metres right up to the roof, are what the locals climb up to gather the swifts' nests. These are even more valuable than the guano, as they are the main ingredient in bird's nest soup. Before you begin, it's time for some safety instructions. As you probably know, this is a huge limestone cave that goes about one kilometre back into the hills, and in places it's a hundred metres in height, and 300 metres wide. There's no need to crawl around in here as you do in other caves, but it's dark inside, of course. That's why I insisted you bring a working light. Please check that it shines brightly, and ensure that you stay together with others who have a good torch. In one of the larger areas of the cave, the roof is pierced, so some sunlight will get through. 
It is best to turn your torches off if you can see well and save your batteries. It's a good idea to put your waterproof jacket on now. The walls may be wet, but that's not the main reason for the jacket. The bats and birds do excrete, and they are above you, so just in case. And of course, your hat or hood also keeps you safe from animal droppings. It's not advisable to use the guard rails as handholds. There are lots of droppings on those rails, and don't forget the cockroaches. You absolutely must follow the marked trails. The guard rails on either side are put there so that you cannot mistake them. We take no responsibility for your safety if you go over or under the rails into other cave areas. Keep your torches shining on the path whenever you are moving, just to be sure of your footing, and don't try to go too fast. You might trip, and you will certainly miss some of the fascinating wildlife in the cave. Now, it's time to begin the tour. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two biology students called Helen and Colin talking about the report they're writing on their recent field trip to a seaside area called Rocky Bay. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. I've brought my notes on our biology field trip to Rocky Bay, Colin, so we can work on our report on the research we did together. OK. I've got mine too. Let's look at the aims of the trip first. Right. What did you have? I just put something about getting experience of the different sorts of procedures used on a field trip. But we need something about what causes different organisms to choose particular habitats. I agree. And something about finding out how to protect organisms in danger of dying out. In our aims? Mm. But we weren't really looking at that. I suppose not. OK, now there's the list of equipment we all had to bring on the field trip. What did they tell us to bring a ruler for? It was something about measuring the slope of the shore. But of course we didn't need it because we were measuring wind direction and we'd brought the compass for that. But not the piece of string to hold up in the air. <laughs> didn't Mr Blake make a fuss about us leaving that behind? Yeah, he does go on. Anyway, it was easy to get one from another of the students. Now, the next section's the procedure. I sent you the draft of that. Yeah. Um, it was clear, but I don't think we need all these details of what time we left and what time we got back and how we divided up the different research tasks. Mm, OK. I'll look at that again. Then we have to describe our method of investigation in detail. Mm. So let's begin with how we measured wave speed. I was surprised how straightforward that was. I'd expected us to have some sort of high-tech device not just stand there and count the number of waves per minute. <laughs> not very precise, but I suppose it was good enough. But the way we measured the amount of salt was interesting. In the water from the rock pools? Yeah. Oh, I wanted to check the chemicals we used in the lab when we analysed those samples. Uh, was it potassium chromate and silver nitrate? That's right. OK. And we need the map of the seashore. You just left that to me. And I had to do it while the tide was low, 
Well, that was okay, but the place I started it from was down on the beach. Then I realised I should have gone up higher to get better visibility, so I had to start all over again. But at least I'd got the squared paper, or I'd have had problems drawing it all to scale. Yeah, it looks good. We could get a map of the region off the internet and see if we need to make any changes. Hmm, I had a look, but I couldn't find anything. But you took some pictures, didn't you? Yeah, I'll email you them if you want. OK, I'll make my amendments using those. Then I can scan it into our report. Great! Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, when we get to our findings, I thought we could divide them up into the different zones we identified on the shore and the problems organisms face in each zone. So for the highest area... The splash zone. Yeah. We found mostly those tiny shellfish that have strong hard shells that act as protection. But not from other organisms that might eat them. Predators. No, that's not the main danger for them, but the shells prevent them from drying out because they're in the open air for most of the time. Right. And since they're exposed, they need to be able to find some sort of shelter or cover themselves up so they don't get too hot. Mm. Then in the middle and lower zones nearer the sea, we need to discuss the effects of wave action. Yes, and how organisms develop structures to prevent themselves from being swept away or even destroyed by being smashed against the rocks. Mm. I haven't done anything on the geological changes. I don't know what to put for that. Mm, no, we weren't concentrating on that. Maybe we need to find some websites. Good idea. I've got the lecture notes from Mr Blake's geology course, but they're too general. Mm. But we could ask him which books on our reading list might be most helpful. Right. OK. Now, I did a draft of the section of sources of possible error in our research, but I don't know if you agree. For example, the size of the sample and whether it's big enough to make any general conclusions from. But I thought, actually, we did have quite a big sample. We did. And our general method of observation seemed quite reliable. But we might not be all that accurate as far as the actual numbers go. Yeah, we might have missed some organisms, mm. if they were hiding under a rock, for example. Mm. I wasn't sure about the way we described their habitats. I decided it was probably OK. Yeah, and the descriptions we gave of the smaller organisms, they weren't very detailed, but they were adequate in this context. I'm not sure we identified all the species correctly, though. OK, we'd better mention that. Now, how... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about various issues in land management and ownership systems by Professor Fred Roberts. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40.
Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all looking so full of energy. Today, I'm going to give an overview of some general principles and issues relating to land management and ownership. Very important. If we look at history, it seems that much of it concerns conflict over religion, economic power, and land. Often, all three factors are involved together. The first question one asks when talking about land is, who owns it? What you can do with land you own depends on one's political views. A far-right conservative may say ownership is the socially supported power to do what you want with the land you own, with no control by government, as long as what you do with it doesn't hurt others. You can imagine how different factions interpret hurt others. By contrast, the political left, socialists, and more to the left communists say land ownership, private land ownership, that is, is the root cause of much injustice in the world. And that the social protection of private land ownership can result in tyranny and oppression. They therefore argue for state, public and cooperative forms of land ownership. I would mention here that most of us take for granted the idea that everything must be owned by a person, people or an organisation. But some societies, notably some native North American tribes, seem to have no concept of personal ownership. It was normal for them simply to take anything they needed and for others to take it from them if they needed it. When European settlers came, the Indians behaved as usual, which led the Europeans to seeing them as thieves. But the European settlers grabbed the Native Americans' land, their most important possession. So who were the real thieves? However, in this day and age, it would be futile to think of getting rid of the concept of ownership. But let me return to land ownership. It's a complex issue. For example, should the owner have exclusive control over the rights of way, like traditional footpaths, or the migration routes of wild animals, or the ecologically important wetlands? Should the owner be allowed to destroy the whole lot by building expensive houses everywhere? Or what if the owner discovers hidden treasure that once belongs to the royal family? All such things raise questions of the rights of the owner as opposed to the rights of others, including animals, perhaps. Clearly, divergent views on such questions are a constant source of argument. What did the classical economists say about land ownership? Their positions were often rather ambiguous. Many of them seemed to consider it a necessary evil, and argued that it could not be defended if there was not some obligation to keep and improve the land. This is the concept of stewardship, that the land must be kept in good condition for future generations. But what if the owners were good stewards of their vast estates, but millions were going hungry? The Marxist answer was, and still is, land reform as a means of social justice. And in the 20th century, I mentioned ecological issues just now. Other reasons for legally restricting the rights of landowners have emerged. You can't cut the trees down because it would cause soil erosion that can spoil rivers hundreds of miles away. Pollution, the need to protect biodiversity, things that reduce the level of what we called nature's services to the general public, all have led to more restrictions on landowners' rights, at least in some countries, especially Europe. At the same time, property taxes have steadily increased to pay for essential services offered by the state or local government, such as firefighting. As these threats to the health of our planet get more serious, some people have argued that the ownership of natural capital, forests, wetlands, etc., will more and more be controlled by communal and not by private bodies. For example, the use by multinational companies of native plant varieties for modified crops and new drugs, plants that they seldom paid for in the past, are now increasingly recognised as belonging to the cultures or ecosystems from which they originated. But it seems to me that having the land and its flora and fauna owned by governments is no guarantee that they'll be used wisely, rather than for short-term profit. The evidence is that local ownership protected by law is usually the best answer. OK, it will soon be time for a break, but before we have our coffee, I will give the answers to the two questions I asked you last time. What are the differences between leasehold and freehold? Essentially, the former allows possession for a limited time, while the latter is a special right granting the full use of real estate for an indeterminate time. In this country, most houses are sold with the land and the house itself freehold. 
whereas many flats are sold with a lease which was issued by the freeholder to the original leaseholder. The flat is then effectively owned by the leaseholder for an agreed number of years. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.